Welcome. This is an introduction to IP version 6. Let's take a brief overview of IPv6. First off, IPv6 is a layer 3 protocol designed to replace the classic IP version 4 protocol, or otherwise referred to as IPv4. The primary improvement of IPv6 is a much larger address space. Other improvements include a more efficient header and several auto configuration features neighbor discovery, and a few other things that we'll discuss in this slide in this slide presentation. First off, IP version 4 replaces the layer 3 protocol known as IP in your typical networking stack. As you can see here, IPv4 operated at layer 3. IPv6 is a replacement for that protocol. IPv6 is a network layer protocol for, in the same way that IPv4 was. Uh, other protocols that the other uh, layers in the OSI model should work perfectly with IPv6, meaning transport layer and your data link layers should work just uh, with IPv6 just as they worked with IPv4. This is theoretical. I'm sure that as we uh, come up with enhancements and improvements to IPv6, we'll discover shortcomings or difficulties with interaction between the protocols like we do with any protocol introduction. IP has been around forever, um, so there is some, some struggles that we're going to have. For example, some applications will only allow the input of IPv4 addresses. Uh, they may require an IP address, and they will not support IPv6 address uh, uh, format. Some applications rely on ARP or IPv4 broadcasts or other IPv4 specific protocols that come with IPv4 such as ICMP uh, Echo uh, or something like that, in which IP, embedded in the IP version 4 protocol stack is a requirement that is needed by a specific application or by a specific network, uh, a network application or network protocol. IPv6 has a much larger address space than IPv4. IPv6 has a 128-bit address as opposed to IPv4, which is a 32-bit address. Whereas IPv4 had 4 billion in some addresses, IPv6 has a lot of unique address capabilities. And you can see the exact number here in the slide. Um, because IPv6 has so many possible addresses, we can do some things uh, we can be very liberal with the use of IP addresses, whereas in, in the past we've been restricted by the, uh, the size of the address space. So IP address space is very big. This gives us uh, more addresses, but it also allows us to use addresses uh, in a way that we, we could never do before. For example, in subnetting, uh, we no longer have to worry about the number of machines in the network. We just simply have to worry about the number of networks required. So no longer do we, do we concern ourselves with how many IPs are needed per subnet. We simply assign everybody the same very large block. We also no longer need NAT. Uh, if you remember, network, network address translation was designed so that we could put a device in between our private network and our public network in order to reduce the exhaustion of public addresses. NAT is no longer required. Hosts can also automatically assign themselves. Because every computer has a MAC address, that MAC address can now be embedded in the IP version 6 address. So therefore, we can use the MAC address to auto-configure and auto-sign an IP address. This allows us to uh, um, basically assign every machine their own unique IP address based on their MAC. The packet header in IP version 6 has also had significant improvement. For example, IP version 6 has fewer fields. Now, IP version 6 obviously adds a 128-bit uh, address, which is greater than the 32-bit that was consumed by IP version 4. But IP version 6 uh, removes fields that were unnecessary before, so the total gain in IP version 6 header space is not as much, uh, considering the fact that we're removing a lot of additional headers that were in the IP version 4 header space. So an IP version 4 header could be between 20 and 60 bytes, but an IP version 4 header is always 40 bytes. So you can see we're not adding a lot to the network payload by going to IPv6. IP version 4 packets contain a checksum, whereas IP version 6 does not. See, IP version 6 relies on other protocols completely to do that feature. Optional IP version 6 are no longer tied to the header. Whereas IP version 4, you had all these optional header features that you had to have in there whether you used them or not. IP version 6 doesn't require that. 
So IP version six can be a much more efficient uh, or appear to be much more efficient just simply because of header space and header room. However, uh, one of the diff disadvantages we have with uh, IP version six rolling out is most of the hardware, switches and routers that are out there and even computers were designed to optimize IP version four. So until hardware manufacturers catch up and they design equipment that is also designed to optimize IP version six, you won't see the improvement in overhead, uh, improvement efficiency that we would normally get with a more efficient header. We have to wait for hardware vendors to catch up. IP version six also improves auto configuration dramatically. IP version four had a protocol called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. IP version six also has that protocol. It's now called DHCP v6. This allows for a stateful auto configuration, much like DHCP did in IP version 4. IP version 4 all, version 6 also supports what we call stateless auto address auto configuration or SLAC, S L A A C. This provides for auto configuration uh, to a node um, that is stateless. And we'll talk a little bit about, about more what that means here in a few minutes. So IP version 4 provided a very basic stateless uh, auto configuration. If you remember, this was called APIPA, or Automatic Private IP Address Assignment. Basically, it assigned you a, an address out of the space 169.254. address. But the problem is, is you couldn't access outside networks because you had no gateway. Um, addresses were dynamic, uh, and they changed, or they had the ability to change. And people d implemented APIPA differently uh, depending on what vendor you are. So uh, it was not very good. Well, Slack improves upon the stateless auto configuration uh, in a significant way. And we'll take a look at the difference between DHCP v6 and Slack uh, in, in, in subsequent slides. Before we do any of that, though, let's take a look, uh, a deeper look at the IP version 6 address format. Well, first off, the address format is 128 bits long. It's represented using all hexadecimal. The, the number would be just too long to represent it with uh, binary. And so we basically represent it in hexadecimal and we separate uh, it into eight blocks of 16 bit hexadecimal characters uh, that are separated by colons. So as you can see here, this 2A03, 2A03, basically each one of those characters represents uh, uh, four bits for a total of 16 bits. So each represents, so four, 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 four for a total of 16 bits. We separate each of these 16 bit um, uh, blocks by a colon. And so we basically have eight of those. Uh, so you have eight 16 bit hex blocks in the IP version six address. But notice this document right here, these example IPv6 addresses I've given you. Notice they're different and the lengths are different. Well, if I have eight blocks of 16-bit hex, how come they're not all the same length? Well, that's because we use shortcut notation. So we're going to talk about how to shorten the IP version 6 address to make it easier to write and easier to understand. Full IP version 6 addresses are really long. So to make them easy, we've abbreviated them in a couple of ways. First, leading zeros can be removed from any address. So if there's leading zeros, we can remove them. Second, a group of zeros can be compressed by using a double colon. So, and you can also combine both of these methods together to create a really short address. Let's take, we're gonna take a look at how leading zeros are removed. So let's take a look at how leading zeros are removed from an IPv6 address. Notice here, in my, sec, in my first example, 0001 colon can be reduced to just one colon. See, I've removed the leading zeros in that block. And same, same with the next one, 0012, I've removed the two zeros and it's now one, two. Notice though that I cannot remove trailing zeros. I can only remove leading zeros. So for example, on one zero 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 zero, that still is represented as one zero zero zero. You cannot remove those zeros like you can with, uh, with leading zeros. So that's the first way that we can shorten an IPv6 address is by removing or removing leading zeros in each block. The next way is with zero compression. 
Zero compression is uh, you can only do it once in an address. You cannot do it in multiple locations. So for one address, you can only do it in one place. So here I have an example. I have an IPv6 1234 colon 5678 colon, then a bunch of zeros, and then I end with two blocks. Notice all of those zeros can be compressed to two colons in a row. I've now taken all those zeros. Now you may ask yourself, well, how would I know uh, how many zeros are compressed? Well, I know that by the number of blocks that are available. So as you can see here, how many blocks do I normally have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks, right? So if I compress those zeros in the middle, I now have one, two, three, four left over. So now I know that there must be four blocks of zeros in between those two colons. So that's how I can know how many zeros there are. So this is what the this is the same address complex. Now you can only do this once. So for example, if I have an address like this one down below, I can compress this once, meaning uh, I can compress this block of zeros in red, or I can compress the block of zeros in blue, but I cannot compress both of them. The reason why I can't compress both of them is I have no idea how many zeros are in each block. So you can only compress one block of zeros. So this last example here is a complete no-no. You cannot compress two blocks of zeros in an IPv6 address. Let's take it some real world example. So let's try with a real address. This is uh, Wikipedia's IPv6 address. So let's take a look at that. Here is a compressed and leading zeros removed, right? So we, we've taken the leading zeros. So uh, um, that's pretty much how you, how you, how you do it. So, um, so I'm removing now the uh, compressed version. Notice that 0, 0, 0, 0, the leading zeros have been removed. Uh, now here is um, removing it with the leading zeros removed. As you can see here, the 0, 0, 0, 1 becomes a 1. The 0, 0, 0, 0 becomes a 0. And here's the no compression, which is the full address. So all three of these, all, all of these, all four of these examples are the same address. So this, this one down below is the full address. This is the one with no uh, with leading zeros removed, uh, with no compression. Notice that zero 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 one right uh, is is not compressed. I've just removed the leading zeros. Whereas um, here is compressed. Um, see, notice the two colons have removed those three blocks of zeros. You see that? So that's basically how that works. So these are all the same address. They're just written in a different way. So now that we understand what an IP version 6 address is, so when you look at it, you're not so confused. You don't look at it and go, whoa, what is this FE80 colon colon 1? You now know what that means. Hopefully now you can understand a little bit more about IP version 6 addresses, types, and scopes. IP version 6 uh, is just like IP version 4. Different types of addresses have different purposes. Like IPv4, IPv6 supports unicast and multicast address types. However, IPv6 does not support a broadcast address. It uses multicast groups to uh, uh, pretend like it's a broadcast, if you will. Uh, the reason why is broadcasts are just considered bad. Uh, sending a, 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 a packet out to just everybody is not good practice. So we use multicast groups to reduce the limit and the scope of a broadcast. So we no longer have broadcast with IP version 6. So IP version 6 also supports what is called an anycast address. Um, and we'll talk more about anycast in a minute. IP version 4 did kind of have the idea of anycast, but nobody really used it. So IP version 6 does take advantage of the concept of anycast, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Let's first talk about unicast, though, because it's important to understand the terms. So unicast is basically node-to-node -node communication, just like we're used to in IP version 4. Uh, so basically, you go from node to node, one machine to one machine, or point to point. Unlike IP version 4, though, IP version 6 enabled nodes will always have a multi, multiple unicast addresses, meaning an IP uh, version 6 host will have multiple IP version 6 addresses. Whereas an IP version 4 machine could usually only have one unicast, or sometimes you could add a second, but it typically only had one unicast address. In IPv6, you can reach that machine by multiple uh, addresses uh, assigned to it. 
Um, however, uh, the IP version six addresses that get assigned to that machine have different scopes. So I'll have an address for one scope and I'll have an address for another scope and I may have an address for another scope. So IP version six addresses get assigned to the machine based on the scopes that that machine requires. Let's take a ne next look at, uh, so we looked at unicast, let's look at multicast. Uh, this works just the same way it did in IP version 4. One machine sends to a group of machines known as a multicast. Um, so, and basically this is, uh, um, there are several um, established, well-known multicast groups. Uh, and if we take advantage of those multicast groups, our multicast functionality of IPv6 will behave just like IP version 4 broadcasts did. Um, once again, multicast addresses are also divided into scopes. So just like a unicast address is divided into scopes, multicast addresses are divided into scopes as well. Finally, let's get to the last one, which is an IPv6 anycast. This is a special type of communication from node to node. And, and basically the concept is this. There are a group of machines that can respond to the anycast, but basically only one machine will respond. It's usually the one that is closest. So basically you send something out to a group of machines and anyone can respond, usually the one that is considered closest via a uh, shorter path or, or the one that responds the fastest will be, uh, will be the one that responds, okay? And so uh, any cast addresses inherit the unicast address scopes. So any casts are in the same scope types as unicast addresses are. But any casts are used for special communications, um, which we'll talk about later. Let's just uh, review just a couple of key points about address scopes. IP version 6 address scopes set limits on what those addresses can communicate with. So if you have a scope that is central, to, is, is scope for only like a local area, then you're only able to communicate with that address in the local area. Whereas you might have a scope that is global, so you can use that address to communicate with a global scope. So each scope uh, limits what you can talk to. An IP version 6 address within a particular scope can only communicate with addresses in that scope. So if you have your local scope address, um, you can only communicate with other machines that also have that local scope address uh, in that same scope. You are not allowed to use a local address to communicate with a global address, for example. Uh, you cannot jump from one scope to another. If a node needs to communicate with a multiple scope, then you will have to assign multiple addresses. So if your machine is gonna communicate local, you give it a local address scope. If it's going to communicate global, then you also give it a global address scope. This is a huge departure from what you're used to. So IP version 4 definitely um, is different in this regard. IP version 4 does not have scopes. Um, however, we did have the ability to make reservations um, where we could reserve addresses for an IP version 4 node, which might be perceived as the same idea, but it's really a completely different concept. Let's talk about the first major uh, scope type, which is called a unicast address scope. First off, there's a, sp a special address called the unspecified address. This is called colon colon, and it's uh, on a slash 128. And this is basically all zeros, right? Because they, all the zeros are compressed. So basically, this is used when the node does not have an assigned address. The IP version 4 equivalent of this was 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. So that's what that address is. It's a special address. You also have the loopback. The loopback is one, right? So all zeros compressed with a one at the end. And the IP version four equivalent was 127.0.0.1, often referred to as local host. So in this case, the local host or the loopback address for IPv6 is colon colon one. So once you learn how to ping with IPv6, you can ping that loopback address and get a response and this allows you to test the functionality of TCP IP on your local machine. Your machine can also be assigned a global unicast address. This is going to be varied. Every machine will have a different one. But the global unicast address begins with a global routing prefix uh, that is fixed. 
Now the IP version for equivalent for this was having public addresses like a class A, class B, class C address. And so this is for general communication from node to node across the internet. And this is called what we call the global unicast. And this allows you to communicate globally. So the scope is global. There's also an IP version for transition address. Basically what it does is it takes the entire IP version 4 address space and puts it inside uh, an IPv6 address. And this was to transition from IPv4 to IPv6. Basically, you know you're dealing with an IPv4 transition address when you see it as compressed zeros, colon, colon, with four Fs followed by, and you'll see the IP address embedded in there. This is the IP version 4 transition address. You also have what was called link local addresses. Link local addresses are defined as a scope as only local. This is the um, APIPA equivalent. Uh, it's actually much better than APIPA. Um, but remember, APIPA and IPv4 use the 169.254/16 network range. Link local uses FE80 uh, colon colon followed by whatever number. And so FE80 is how you know you're dealing with the link local. This would be for machines that need to communicate locally but no, don't need to communicate on a global scope. You also have what we just called unique local addresses. Unique local addresses are, are not routable, meaning they cannot be routed globally. They can be freely assigned by a network administrator on a local network. And um, in this case, it's followed by FC00, colon, colon. And uh, this, don't confuse this with NAT. Um, these address these unique local addresses cannot be natted to a public address that doesn't exist rather these are local addresses that you want to be unique you don't want to be duplicated and they're non routable multicast address scopes there are predefined multicast address scopes based on the size of the scope and you can create your own there's uh you can create eight custom multicast scopes uh but beyond the custom ones these are the following. There's five of them. You have what is called interface local, which is the um, node's own network interface. Link local, which is everybody that is local to you. Site local, which is a physical site which the node uh, resides. Organization local, which is an autonomous system that, that that machine is joined. And then there's global, which means everybody. And these are what we call multicast address scopes. So when I, when I send a communication, to a group of machines, I can choose to send it to one of those multicast scopes. Just out, just out my interface, just to my local, just to my site, just to my organization, or globally. And then there's custom ones you can create as well. So let's take a look at some of the predefined multicast addresses. IPv6 has several predefined ones that replace uh, IPv4 broadcasts. Um, and so let's take a look at those. First off, you have the all nodes address. That's FF01. Uh, colon colon one. This one is called interface local, and then you have FF02 colon colon one, which is link local. So both of these uh, communicate to local nodes. So if I wanted to send a multicast or a broadcast, if you will, to all machines locally, I would send it to that address and it would achieve the same purpose as an old IPv4 broadcast. Then you have the all routers address, which will communicate with all routers. Uh, that one's FF012 and FF022. So that is the address for all routers to listen to. Uh, a lot of times we need to send router advertisements out, for example, and we want all routers to hear it. We all have the solicited node address, and that's FF02 colon colon one, and then you can see the rest of the address there. This is specifically for IP version six discovering other IP version six machines. So this is used for neighbor discovery. So IPv6 hosts will naturally listen to this to participate in neighbor discovery solicitations. Speaking of which, let's do a deep dive into neighbor discovery and talk about what that is. Neighbor discovery is a process in IPv6 that manages communications among nodes on a local link. Uh, this is important for a lot of reasons. Let's talk about the four main functions that it serves. First off, it provides information about the network, what routers are available, what prefixes have been used, uh, maximum transmission unit size, those things that a network node needs to know. Uh, 
it needs to also it's used to resolve the MAC addresses of neighboring nodes. Remember, we used to use ARP. Well, we don't use that anymore. We use what is called neighbor discovery. And neighbor discovery is what resolves the MAC. It does much more than just get the MAC, though. It does all these other things like discover machines, routers, gateways. All these things are handled by the neighbor discovery process. It also lets you know what nodes are reachable. I mean, why send a communication if the node is not up, right? Uh, it also provides a better redirection to another gateway. So let's say you're trying to communicate out and your gateway goes down. It'll redirect to a gateway that is available. So it serves these primary four functions, and these are all limitations of the IP version 4 protocol that have been improved upon in IPv6. Uh, network discovery replaces the need for ARP. It replaces the need for what is called ICMP redirect and ICMP router discovery. So those three protocols are now gone and no longer required when using IPv6. Let's talk a little bit more about the mechanics of neighbor discovery. Neighbor discovery works by sending ICMP version 6 messages. So these are the uh, um, ICMP protocol uh, using the version 6 of that protocol. First off, uh, network discovery sends out a router solicitation. Um, host machines will send out a solicitation asking if there are any routers on my local link because you might need a router in order to communicate with another network. So I will send a solicitation out looking for uh, routers on my uh, local link. Second, router advertisement. Uh, routers will send out router solicitations to find other routers and provide information about, about what prefixes are used, uh, what uh, maximum transmission unit is being used, um, what routes are available, and any auto configuration information that might be on that particular router. Uh, we also uh, will redirect. So routers can send a neighbor discovery to redirect hosts to go to another or a better path than the one that they are on. So uh, that is the purposes and the reasons behind network discovery. We can also do neighbor solicitation. So hosts can solicit each other with network discovery. Uh, and, and, and this is the replacement of what we used to know as ARP. So it'll go out and find out, hey, are you reachable? And if you are, tell me what your Mac is. Um, and also, this is a great way for us to discover if there are duplicate IP version 6 addresses in our local scope. We can also use it as neighbor advertisement. Neighbor advertisement allows us to let us know that there are nodes available on the network to talk to. Uh, these are sent as a response to a solicitation. Um, it provides information on whether the node is a host or it's a routing device, and it'll provide the MAC address of the node that is performing the neighbor advertisement. All right, let's now talk about another major feature of IPv6, which is the ability to do auto configuration. As you can imagine, manually assigning IP version 6 addresses could be a bit time consuming. So auto configuration is a process of automatically assigning a global unique address to an interface without somebody actually having to go to that machine to program it. IPv6 has two ways of doing this. <clears throat> First way is called stateful auto configuration and the second way is called stateless auto configuration. An IP version 6 network can use uh, either one uh, or both at the same time or neither. So you can choose to go with both or just one or none at all. So that's auto configuration. Let's talk about stateful. Stateful requires a central server. This is known as a DHCP version 6 server. So uh, basically it tracks all of the hosts addresses given to hosts on an IP version 6 address. These are th two things unique to DHCP version 6. Hosts identify them to DHCP version 6 servers with what is called a DHCP unique identifier or DUID rather than using their MAC address. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this, but we'll, we don't need to talk about that too much. DHCP's uh, six servers can assign entire prefixes uh, to downstream routers via DHCP v6 prefix delegation. This really improves the ability for us to get more devices assigning addresses rather than one central device. So if we have a downstream router uh, at a branch or wherever, we can notify that branch, hey, you've been given this prefix. I want you to assign out addresses for this prefix to that particular network, which makes management of DHCP so much easier. 
Pretty much DHCP, though, version 4 and DHCP version 6 operate effectively the same way. Let's talk about stateless. Stateless, stateless is a unique process in IPv6, which allows IPv6 nodes to generate their own globally unique address. This is done with what we call stateless address auto configuration or SLAC. SLAC relies entirely upon neighbor discovery protocol in order for this to function. Um, they are generated from what is called EUI 64, which is a industry standard. Uh, EUI 64 uh, addresses are gener uh, there's a process for generating an address like this on your machine. We'll talk about it in a minute. It's not just your MAC address, so we need to talk about it. We will. Um, so basically what happens is your EUI, 60 U, EUI 64 number is created by your machine and then it uses that identifier to assign itself a global unique address. And so this is what the process of Slack is. But in order to really get this, we have to know what an EUI 64 number is. This is a 64-bit number that identifies a particular address. For Ethernet interfaces, the EUI64 is derived from the MAC. It is not the MAC. It is simply derived from the MAC. So it is combined with the IPv6 prefix. Now, what happens is your host hears about, uh, from routers, it hears what the available prefix is. It takes that prefix, and it adds it to the EUI64 identifier it's generated, and that is what produces its self-identified address or its Slack address. So how do you actually get from a MAC to an EUI64 to an IPv6 address? Let's go through this because it's rather complicated. First, you start with your MAC address. Then you take the MAC and you split it away from the OUI portion which is the uh, company uh, assigned portion and the Mac port and the NIC portion. So you separate those two out and basically you change the OUI from, from to 0, 02. So you're actually changing the OUI to 0, 02. The 0, 02 lets us know this was an EUI64 generated address, by the way. Then we insert FFFE in between the OUI and the NIC portions and that generates the EUI64 identifier. We then change the colons uh, to IP version 6 by removing leading zeros or whatever we have to do. And then we add a prefix to it that is advertised by the router. Most routers will be advertising a slash 64 or a slash 48 prefix. In this case, just for example purposes, I showed the slash 64. So here's our advertised prefix, a 2001 colon db8 colon colon slash 64. I'm now going to take that and I'm going to append my EUI64 to that IPv6 prefix, and now I have my Slack address. Uh, it'll almost always be the 64 block that gets advertised. And so you'll see 2001 colon DB8, and then your leading zeros, followed by your EUI64. Right? So that's how you get to the Slack address. Now, uh, there is this is the process for how it works. Number one. A node that requires an address sends a router solicitation, uh, which is an ICMP v6 packet, to all routers in the local link. One or more routers will respond back with a router advertisement. So it goes solicitation, advertisement. And basically, it sends an advertisement out uh, advertising what the prefix is for use on that network. For the prefix that are configured to use Slack, so some prefixes will be configured to use Slack. For the ones that are, the machine will take its EUI64, append it, automatically generate the IP version 6 address, and append it, and it will then begin to use that address, and it will assign it to the appropriate interface. Now, some of you hackers have been thinking, hmm, if I have an EUI64 address that I know is derived from the MAC, I can take apart that number and I can figure out what the MAC is. Now, this is a privacy concern. Now, why is it a privacy concern? Well, think about it. If I know what the MAC address of your machine is, I can now know everywhere you go. Because IP version 6 is no longer NAT controlled. So everywhere you go, I can figure out where you've been. Whether your phone, you were, it was your phone, for example. Your phone hit a wireless network at school. 
uh, at a school. Your your uh, phone was on a cell tower. Tower. Your son was at a public hotspot. Some. Your phone was on a public hotspot somewhere. Your phone was in your car. It was on a freeway. It was at an airport. I would. I could be able to by finding that Mac query databases and find out everywhere your device had been because I simply knew what your MAC address was. So that can be a problem. So since Slack addresses are derived from a hardware, hardware address, now we can identify the manufacturer and the model of the NIC on that node, and that's also a privacy concern. So how do we, what do we can do? Well, they implemented what is called privacy extensions for Slack. When privacy extensions are enabled, the node creates a Slack address by combining the IPv6 addresses with a randomly generated host identifier. A node with privacy extensions enabled will use the Slack address as the source address for new in outbound connections. The EUI64 generated IPv6 address is still available for unsolicited inbound connections. So this is what we call privacy extensions. It uses a randomly generated host identifier. And so privacy extensions are available on most operating systems nowadays because when, when EUI64 first came out, everybody was panicking because they thought we would all be given an identifier that could track us wherever we went in the world. And so that's what privacy extensions are for. So how does a node know whether to use DHCP version 6 or Slack? You might have heard me mention it just a few minutes ago. If it is a Slack identified uh, prefix, well, how do you know that? Well, we do that with router advertisement flags. So when we do a solicitation and a router advertisement comes back, we do a router advertisement flag. An IPv6 router sends a router advertisement uh, in response to a solicitation from a node. The router advertisement contains one or more prefixes that it is using for that local link. The router advertisement also includes flags. And the flag will determine, is this a Slack? DHCP version 6, both or neither. And the flags are configured on the router. So in your router, you would have to configure what setting you would want to have, either Slack, DHCP version 6, both or, not, or, or neither. So let's talk about the main router advertisement flags that are available. The two flags that will determine whether to use DHCP version 6 are the M flag and the O flag. The M flag stands for Managed Address Configuration, and that determines whether to use DHCP version 6 for IP configuration. The O flag means Other, determines whether to use DHCP version 6 for configuration of other options, such as DNS, network time servers, things like that. Each prefix that is being advertised also contains an A flag for Autonomous Address Configuration, which determines whether the node should be Slack or not. So you have M, you have O, and then you have A. So M and O refer to DHCP version 6. So if the M flag is on, it means use DHCP. If the O flag is on, it says not only use DHCP, but also use it for other options. If the A flag is on, it says also use it, also configure a Slack address. So here would be an example of the flags. So if we had no address automatic configuration, M, O, and A would all be zeros. If we wanted to have DHCP version 6 to assign the address only, then we would set M to 1. Almost always you have M to 1 and O to 1 at the same time because you also want your DNS server set and everything like that. So here's an example. Uh, the third example here is M, O, and A are all 1. This means DHCP version 6 is being used for everything and we're also using Slack. So there you go. So these are all the different types of options you can, you can do on flags for router advertisements. Now there are some caveats for auto configuration. Now auto configuration is going through a lot of changes. So this slide may be out of date very quickly, but this is the way it is out of the time of this writing of this uh, PowerPoint. Not all devices support uh, auto configuration. So general purpose operating systems will, but a lot of devices won't, like printers, cameras, phones, many of them will not. Uh, although a lot of mobile phones nowadays are, in fact, your mobile phone right now probably has an IP version 6 address. All devices support auto configuration via Slack, but most do not support using DNS versus Slack. Going back to my previous slide, you'll notice that you can have an M0, O1, and A1, meaning you'll use DHCP to get the DNS address, 
but you'll use auto con you'll use auto configuration slack to assign the address this is a unique situation where you want to be assigned a dns server but you don't want to be assigned an ip address by the dhcp server so in that case slack does support that but not all devices will support that so be careful if you try to implement that some devices will not support it all right now the dreaded subject ip version 6 subnetting drum roll please all right so ip version 6 subnetting good news is really easy um but it's just like ip version 6 i mean it's just like ip version 4 oftentimes we need to subnet or break our address down into groups or, or into smaller segments in order to accommodate many organizations within our network. Uh, but subnetting IP version 6 is a lot easier. So let's go over it. One of the challenges of subnetting IPv4 is the balancing the number of networks with the number of usable hosts. Um, in IP version 6, it's really easy. All end user subnets have a subnet mask of slash 64. Done. End of story. Everybody has a slash 64 on an end user subnet. This makes it really easy. Everybody is going to get um, uh, the same size of network. We don't concern ourselves with the number of hosts. There are smaller subnets for loopbacks, point to point links, like between router devices, but these are specialty circumstances. They would not be assigned to hosts. Smaller subnets are not supported. Um, in general, meaning if you use smaller subnets in a slash 64, it will break Slack. Um, it'll also break some other router advertisement issues. So be very careful when trying to create smaller subnets, even if you want to. The only relevant number, the only thing you need to know when calculating an IP version 6 subnet is the number of subnets you need. Never worry about the number of hosts. Unless, of course, you have this gigantic intergalactic network that takes billions of hosts. But I don't think you do. Okay, IP version 6 network should always be subnetted in a hierarchical fashion. So you want route summarization to be used. If you know what IP, if you remember IPv4, we had a way to summarize multiple routes into one address. We do the same, same thing in IPv6. So make sure that when you pick an address, use the next one and the next one. Don't uh, jump all throughout your range if you can avoid it. IPv6 networks should be subnetted such that the subnet mask is divisible by four. Why? Well, this is kind of an interesting idea. Because we're using hexadecimal, we want the number to be divisible by four so we can represent it with a hexadecimal uh, uh, four. Remember, each block in an IPv6 has four hexadecimal digits. So we want to be able to represent the subnet easily with that hexadecimal block so we do not want our range to end in the middle of a hex range we want it to end on a divisible of four so a divisor of four so always make sure that your subnet mask is divisible by four um, so and then you'll know you're good um, and by the way all sub subnets that you want to assign to end users must have a slash 64 subnet mask here's a great example you're a junior network administrator for the finance department for Global Megacorp. A senior administrator has assigned your department an IPv6 address of 2001 colon dead colon beef colon 12 slash 56. Now, you may be wondering, dead beef? Yep, that is a legitimate address. Notice um, uh, D is a valid hex address. E is valid hex. A is valid hex. D is valid hex, right? All those are valid hex numbers. So I know that sounds funny, but that's the way that I just wanted to make sure you understood that. So we started with slash 56. So we want to subnet this slash 56. So you need to provide addresses for nine VLANs. The number of hosts can vary from 40 to 1,000. How will we do this in IPv6? So first off, the number of hosts do not matter. Just focus on the number of VLANs. So we want to take a slash 56, and we're going to take the flat slash 56 and extend it to a slash 64, right? That'll give us 256. So how many bits are different between a slash 56 and a slash 64? That's eight, right? So two to the power of eight is 256. So by extending from a slash 56 to a slash 64, we have created 256 individual 
prefixes. Uh, you can now subnet those directly to 256 prefixes, or you can subnet them into a whole bunch of slash um, 60s, and then subnet them into a bunch of slash 64s if you want to. Either one will work. I've decided to go from a slash 56 straight to a slash 64. I could have went to a slash 56 to a slash 60, and then taken each one of those slash 60s and broke them down into slash 56s. Either one would work. Let's go with the first one. All right, so that's how you do your subnetting. Pretty easy. IP version 6 and DNS. IP version 6 and DNS. DNS has been extended to support IPv6. You now have a record inside DNS called quad A or AAAA. We always say quad A. A quad A resource record has been added to support IPv6 host names. The pointer resource record has also been updated. Pointer is for the reverse lookup from IP to name, not named IP. You have other record net types have not changed. MX, CNAME, NS, those have not changed. But MX, CNAME, A records, all those things, they all support both A and quad A host names. The quad A resource record uh, has been added to support host names and they work exactly the same way that A records did in IP version 4. You basically request, hey, I'd like to know what the IP address is for this DNS host name, and the DNS server replies back with the address. Pointer, pointer records stay as is, but a new format's been created for IPv6. IPv6 used the root domain ip6.arpa. Um, you'll remember IP version 4 had their own root domain, and it still does. IPv6 addresses are represented as individual nibbles, that's what they call them, which is a single hex digit. So every block has four nibbles in it. And these are separated by dots and reversed, and reversed sequentially in order for you to resolve backwards from IP to DNS. Uh, they do not use zero compression when you use these, as well, uh, by the way. So here's a pointer example. Let's say google.com resolves to the following IP address. Let's expand that out to its full IPv6 address. We're going to reverse the digits, and we're going to put a dot in between each nibble. Do you see how that works? Then that is going to be appended to the ip6.arpa pointer record. This gives us the ability, whenever somebody wants to know what the name is for a given IP, I can look at my pointer record and know what the name was. And that's, that's how the IPv6 pointer uh, work. IPv6 addresses are very long and difficult to remember. So uh, it's a very good idea to use DNS and host names with IPv6. People are just not going to remember your IPv6 address. Um, IPv6 addresses will never change, um, or hardly ever, unless you're using a, a Slack address that's using a privacy address. Very rarely will an IPv6 address, because we have so many addresses, a machine will just always keep the same IPv6 address. So we don't have to worry about dynamic DNS and things like that as much. Um, and also, another important point, a DNS server does not need to be an IPv6 host in order for it to have IPv6 resource records. So that's an important consideration. So you can support IPv6 without your DNS server actually having IPv6 on it. <clears throat> All right, last but not least, let's go over in Microsoft Windows, what are some command line tools you can use to test out IPv6? First off, um, Windows Vista and Greater all support IPv6. So IPv6 is supported. Windows XP and 2003 server support IPv6, but you have to add it. And when you add it, you don't get DHCP v6. Uh, you don't get DNS lookups. Uh, um, it must be configured via the command line. There's no way to program it in there manually with a graphical interface. And a lot of the services in, in Windows 2003 and XP will not recognize IPv6. So everything I'm going to talk about here assumes that we're using um, uh, we're, this assumes that we're using uh, Windows Vista and Greater. By the way, uh, router discovery is also not available uh, in, in Windows to XP as well. So here's your uh, IPv6 IP config. So if you have an IP version 6 address and you type IP config at the command prompt, so you will get an output that looks like this. The IP config will show your IPv6 address. 
um, it'll also show um, your IP version 4 address if you have one. Notice in this case, I have a temporary address. I have a link local address. I have a global address. So notice I have multiple addresses automatically assigned by IPv6. So uh, notice the particular one right here at the top uh, was obtained by a DHCP version 6 server. Uh, the reason why I know that is because it's preferred. It got it through the auto configuration and it came from DHCP version 6. It is a global address. And you can set, tell when the lease was obtained and when the lease is expired. The next one is a temporary address. This was assigned by Slack. Uh, Slack used a EUI64 address, and so this one was assigned by Slack. The next one is the link local IP version 6 address. This one is the, uh, it does not follow EUI64. It's just a link local address assigned. Um, notice it contains at the end a percent %11. This is Windows' method to track a zone. So uh, Windows has um, routing zones in it for its firewall and stuff. So it knows that this is zone for 11, which is probably the local zone, right? Um, you also can see what your default gateway is. Um, you also saw in your IPv6 address um, what your DUID was, your, uh, your DHCP unique identifier. And so that was in there. And you can also see what your DNS server was that was assigned. The next command is called ping. In order to ping a host via an IPv6, you have to type ping space dash six. Um, um, and then you can ping the IP address. And so that's how you can ping it um, uh, with, with uh, um, IPv6. Okay. The next command is called trace route. If you do trace route dash six, you can trace it using IPv6. Now, you can only do these commands if you're actually on an IPv6 network. You can actually get on an IPv6 network actually very easily by registering for and getting your own IP version six address at Hurricane Electric or some IPv6 provider like that. Another command is called path ping. Path ping will, uh, figure out your path is and if it follows an IPv6 path it'll tell you um, the IP version 4 path ping would be the same um, NS lookup when you type NS lookup you can type NS lookup space dash type equals quad, uh, quad A right and then the domain and then the domain will reply back the server will reply back with the IPv6 address rather than the IP version 4 address you can also look up a, a, a pointer record. If you know what the um, IP address is, you can look. Uh, you can reverse it and look it up that way. In this case, in this example, I did a pointer. We did a pointer record looking for this particular address, and we got back Wikipedia. The next command is net sh. Net sh allows you to see if there's any uh, neighbor cache stuff like that. When I type at NN net sh interface IPv6 show neighbors, this shows me all of my IPv6 machines that were discovered via the IPv6 neighbor discovery process. Next command is route. You can type route print dash six. This will show you your IP version six routing table. And that's basically it. So we have gone over the entire IP version six address space. Uh, I've covered all the basic ideas, auto configuration, neighbor discovery, address format, uh, how addresses are created. Um, so hopefully you got a pretty good picture of what an IP version 6 address is now. Thank you very much.